Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, warmly welcome back. Uh, I'm Cecilia Christerson, and the Vice uh, Rector for Challenge-Based Learning and um, Global Engagement. And we have had today um, a full day of discussions around universities' role in global engagement for sustainable development. And uh, we sort of devoted the first day, the part of the day, to um, learning for change. And now I'm really happy to hand over uh, the final part of this day related to the series of knowledge for change. And I will do that to my dear colleague, our vice rector for challenge based. No, not challenge based learning, cha societal challenges. It's a lot of challenges here, but we look forward to this. So, Tapio Salonen, I hand over to you. Thank you. And uh, we also want to greet all who uh, look from the streaming. So, we have many more to, who will en enjoy this uh, seminar. Uh, this is uh, the last, is, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of this year's uh, seminars in this series of, of uh, very special seminars uh, that we have had of knowledge for change. This is to mark then, of course, the, the uh, change within our new uh, uh, university. And uh, uh, you could, uh, if you want to see I just want to make an announcement for, for earlier. So if you go into our website, you're going to see all of the former uh, uh, lectures, uh, both streamed, but also like short essays. And, and I'm sure that you will find uh, uh, many of these uh, quite, quite interesting. Uh, so this uh, series, Knowledge for Change, is uh, with internationally well well uh, known uh, uh, scholars uh, uh, that we want to highlight very central uh, challenges for 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 our university uh, and uh, today we will focus on urging patterns of migration and mobility in Europe and. Uh, to present today's distinguished uh, speaker, I will leave the floor to Professor Peter uh, Bevelander, who is the director of MEME. Uh, this is one of our uh, distinguished institute, uh, Malmö Institute for Studies of Migration, Diversity and, and Welfare. So please give Peter a warm hand. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and guests, it is a great honor for me to uh, introduce today's speaker, Professor Rainer Bauböck, in the Malmö University's Knowledge for Change series. First of all, Professor Bauböck is not new to us here in Malmö. In the autumn of 2000, Rainer was the first Willy Brandt guest professor at the Department of International Migration and Ethnic Relations, IMER, or EMER, as we say in Sweden. This guest professorship, in remembrance of Willy Brandt, very generously provided by the city of Malmö, has meant extremely much for the development of migration research at the university. Having Professor Bauböck as the first guest professor really set the level of this position very high and is also, has also induced to attract new great scholars after him. Secondly, Professor Bauböck also received an honorary doctorate in 2013 at this university for his achievements in migration research and especially his groundbreaking work on migration and its connection to citizenship of different legal statuses of immigrants in a broad sense. Currently, Reiner Bauböck is professor at the Global Governance Program of the Robert Schumann Center for Ad Advanced Studies at the European University Institute in Florence. From 2007 to 2018, he was chair of social and political 
theory at the Department of Political and Social Sciences of the European University Institute. He is a member of the uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences and chair of Ac the Academy's Commission on Migration and Integration Research. His research interests are focused on normative political theory and comparative research on democratic citizenship, European integration, migration, nationalism and minority rights. He is also the coordinator of Global CIT, an online observatory on citizenship and voting rights. He has published widely in top-ranked international journals and contributed to an impressive number of books. The latest one, which I can recommend highly, is Democratic Inclusion, Rainer Bauwerk in Dialogue, and it came out just this year. In this book, Professor Bauwerk lays out in a lead essay his pluralist theory of citizenship that summarizes his thinking about democratic inclusion and also includes responses from other scholars in the field. Today, Professor Bauberg's title for a talk is Migration and Mobility, European Dilemmas. I almost think that this title speaks for itself. It will take up the ongoing debate in migration studies on different forms of human geographical movement long-term migration on one side and short-term mobility on the other. However, globalization, increased economic and political change and development in areas near Europe have had and will continue to have increased international movements by different mobile categories and thus that European states today struggle how to handle this increased migration and mobility. In other words, European states have a public and political polarization when it comes to migration. Those who want open, liberal societies with more openness and those that basically want to close their borders for newcomers. Linking this topic to today's political situation in Sweden is very obvious. Although Sweden is a relative latecomer to join the club, and could have learned from developments in neighboring countries, by the way. We are now in the midst of dealing with this public and political cleavage. So I think it's very appropriate to have this lecture here today. Let's give a warm applause to Roberta Raubek. Is working now? Yes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks a lot for the very warm welcome, also for the good turnout uh, after a long day of talks. Uh, and especially uh, thanks also to Peter for the very generous introduction and for summarizing my talk. I almost feel I don't have to give it anymore. Uh, I will uh, talk about mobility and migration mostly in the European context. So forgive me if I don't have too much to say about Sweden and about Malmö. I'm ready to address questions uh, as they come up after my lecture. Uh, but I will uh, give a very general talk about uh, changing patterns of migration and different circumstances under which states try to control migration. And I see in, uh, I think that in this regard, we, maybe my lecture still fits the general title of the series. Uh, change is going on and it's coming to Europe in a massive way in the field of migration. And we have to uh, step up our knowledge about this change. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that this knowledge is not just the statistics uh, that we have to collect uh, and uh, the analysis that we have to do of the phenomenon, but also we have to think through uh, the ethics of migration. Uh, as Peter mentioned, my chair in Florence was in the field of normative political theory, and I will be talking partly from that perspective, what states ought to do and what they ought not to do in regulating migration. And the talk but in three parts, basically. Uh, the first part will be a little bit more conceptual about 
migration and mobility and why they are not the same thing, but two different perspectives of looking at the same thing, which is human movement. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, the policy dilemmas that Europe faces, mostly in, in relation to migration from Africa and the Middle East. Uh, and I will suggest that there may be good answers what could and should be done. No perfect ones, but relatively better ones than the ones we see the, on the table uh, today. But in the final part of my talk, I will talk about domestic politics in Europe and how migration has come to be at the center of domestic politics and why it may be driven by a newly emerging cleavage in the political landscape that makes it terribly hard to reach consensus on good migration policies. And I'm afraid I will leave you there with this uh, open and rather skeptical message that we may be at the turning point, but we don't know yet what's around the corner because that will depend not just on our knowledge, but also on uh, how our democracies respond to the phenomenon politically. I don't have any slides to show, no figures, no charts, no photos. Uh, I will give an old-fashioned lecture. That also means I will mostly read from the text. So please uh, bear with me. I hope it won't become too boring for you. So, let's start with the earliest times of history. Human beings are migratory animals, just like many other species of animals. Unlike with some birds, however, their migration patterns are not primarily seasonal. Over the long course of early human history, they've mostly migrated in order to populate new habitats around the world. They've captured the world out of Africa. It was the agrarian revolution of the Neolithic age that transformed nomadic patterns of hunters and gatherers within a habitat into more sedentary economies and lifestyles. More or less simultaneously, the first cities were created as centers of power from where large political territories could be ruled. The triple invention of agriculture, of the city, and of political territory with more or less fixed borders changed not only the patterns of geographical movement, but also the way they were perceived. Henceforth, it became possible to distinguish migrants who cross the political border from natives who either have a stable residence inside the territory or whose movement is confined within it. There are thus two different ways of looking at human movement. as physical relocation, which can be described and measured by parameters of space and time, and as the crossing of political borders which can be described and measured only by assuming that these borders are relatively stable over time and that they contain a relatively stable population within them. Let's call the first description of movement mobility and the second one migration. This distinction did probably not matter much until fairly recently. As long as states did not have the power and ambition to control migration at their borders and to unleash mobility within them, any person turning up in a village square was a stranger, no matter whether she was from another continent or another village across the mountains. It was the European conquest of most of the rest of the world and the European invention of an international state system that has made the distinction between mobility and migration fundamentally important for our time. As the background for migration, this state system is based on a few basic assumptions and norms. <clears throat> First, each piece of land and coastal water belongs to one state and one state only. And state borders are relatively stable and they are mutually recognized between states. Second, humanity is categorized by nationality so that also every human being belongs to one state. And thirdly, states are territorially sovereign. Their borders do not only demarcate their jurisdiction, but they are also sites where they can legitimately control migration. These assumptions are not perfectly met, and imperfection leaves room for variation and change. There is Antarctica, which, is still, which still hasn't been fully divided up between states. <clears throat> 
in the 20th century, state borders have changed quite often due to wars, the disintegration of empires, or secessions. And human beings are not as neatly sorted into states as territories. There are persistently high numbers of stateless people in the world and a rapidly growing number of multiple nationals. Most states have subscribed to the human rights conventions and have thereby signed away their right to control out-migration from their territory, which used to be their main concern until the 19th century, as well as the right to expel their surplus populations, their criminals and their dissenters to other territories. All that states can claim now is the right to control immigration of non-citizens. Yet the assumptions still remain powerful in shaping our perception of migration and the political instruments for regulating it. They underpin also a set of individual and state rights that are spelled out in international law. Everybody has the right to move freely within the state territory and to leave that territory. Every citizen <coughs> has the right to return and every state has the duty to readmit its nationals. Every state has the right to decide whether to admit non-citizens to its territory, to determine the conditions for their stay, and to determine under its own law who are its nationals. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold and I will probably have to cough in between. <laughs> I suggest that we may be approaching a threshold where this old way of distinguishing mobility from migration and governing the latter might become unsustainable. And Europe is, once again, the historical laboratory where this change becomes visible in the most dramatic way. A first observation that points to this conclusion is the increasing discrepancy between migration and mobility in sheer statistical terms. Statistics of international migration count the number of persons who have resided in a country other than their state of birth for more than 12 months. With 3.5% the share of international migrants in the world population, as calculated by the UN Department of Social and Economic Affairs, is surprisingly low and stable over time. The figure is nearly the same as in 1900, also due to general population growth, the absolute number, of now uh, 258 million international migrants is much larger. These numbers underestimate, however, <laughs> the phenomenon of global migration systematically because of the assumptions generated by the international state system. They do not include temporary and circular migrants who stay abroad for less than one year. And they exclude those who return to their country of origin because these people are regarded as exercising mobility rather than engaging in migration. Compare these figures now with international tourist arrivals, which have grown continuously year by year from 25 million in 1950 to 1 1.3 billion in 2017. International tourists cross state borders, but they are not perceived as migrants because they visit other societies without taking up residence or work. While crossing a border changes the social and legal status of migrants and the composition of standing and receiving states, international tourism is a form of mobility that floats on the surface of societies, so to speak, without triggering demographic change. Yet tourism does have an indirect impact on states' capacity to control migration. Building walls and mobilizing armies at the border in order to deter irregular migrants does not help to curb the increasing number of people who enter states at airports, harbors, and border crossing points with tourist visa and who subsequently overstay. Consider also the rise of other forms of international movement that do not match the standard types of labor migration, family unification, and refugee flows, such as international student exchange, or intra-company transfers, both of which have increased steeply. These are not unregulated forms of mobility, but they are largely self-regulated by non-state actors, such as universities or companies, when it comes to selecting migrants. <coughs> <coughs> 
There are still other forms of human, of human movement that blur the distinction between mobility and migration even more strongly. I've already mentioned the growing number of multiple citizens in the world. This trend has three drivers. First, the international norm that every state can determine its own nationals, which means that use sanguinis laws in a country of origin, meaning you gain citizenship by descent, and use solely laws in a country of settlement, where you gain citizenship by birth in the territory, produce second generation children with multiple nationality. Second, norms of gender equality in human rights conventions uh, have met that wives no longer automatically acquire their husband's nationality and that children can inherit their mother's as well as their father's citizenship. Third, there is a fundamental change in political attitude of source countries towards their so-called diasporas, which they used to regard mostly as lost populations and now see increasingly as an economic, cultural and political resource. As a result, emigrants have been allowed to retain their original nationality when adopting that of their host country. Conversely, immigration states have dropped previous requirements that applicants must renounce their previous nationality, as Sweden did in 2000. The effect of this global trend is to transform migration into mobility, since multiple nationals enjoy unconditional admission rights in several countries and can move between them just as internal migrants within the state territory do. This mobility effect of multiple citizenship is also a main reason where the increasing supply, the offer by states for multiple citizenship or the toleration, has been met by an even greater demand. It is not only already set national migrants who want dual citizenship so that they can move between their sources of selling passports with high mobility values to investors. In Europe, Cyprus, Malta, uh, Bulgaria, uh, uh, Macedonia and Montenegro, uh, Austria are countries that have engaged, tried to compete in this market for the global investors. States that offer citizenship for cash or investment usually do not require that their newly minted citizens must take up residence. A final form of international mobility that I want to highlight is the emergence of regional free movement regimes created by states granting each other's nationals not only visa-free entry, but also access to long-term residence and employment. The best known free movement regime of this kind is of course the European Union. It has established its own supranational citizenship whose core uh, is a right of free movement throughout the Union's territory and of non-discrimination on grounds of nationality. The EU has the most advanced regional free movement regime, but there have been similar small case and early experiments, such as the common travel area between the UK and Ireland, the trans-Tasman travel arrangement between Australia and New Zealand, and the Nordic passport union. Moreover, there are similar arrangements today between the Mercosur states in South America, the ECOWAS states in Western Africa, that also aspire to create seamless areas of free movement. Such reciprocity-based regional agreements on free movement have large spillover effects for the governance of international migration. For the sake of removing obstacles to free movement of persons and goods, the members of the Schengen Agreement have committed to abolishing border controls, with temporary exceptions in case of public security threats and emergencies. That also allows third country nationals with the Schengen visa to travel freely within the large geographic area. Open internal borders did not only push EU member states towards joint controls of external borders, they also meant that hundreds of thousands of asylum seekers arriving in summer 2015 had not only entered Greek but also EU territory and consequently headed north to their destinations in Austria, Germany and Sweden. The logic of joint control of external borders, open internal borders and a common asylum system clashed head-on with the principle of the Dublin regulation that the first European country of asylum is responsible not merely for examining asylum claims, which is, which is reasonable, but also for hosting refugees permanently. Attempts by the EU institutions to resolve the contradiction through mandatory refugee relocation schemes 
he failed miserably, as we know. Equally significant, the gradual enlargement of the EU has meant that large groups of international migrants from candidate states for EU accession were suddenly transformed from third country nationals who had often been in irregular status into mobile citizens from one to the next day, even if some member states restricted their access to the labor market during lengthy transition periods, which Sweden, by the way, did not do. Sweden was, I think, the only country that for the first two enlargement rounds, 2004, 2007, did not uh, make reservations with regard to access to the labor market. Also in terms of integration policies, the distinction between mobile citizens and migrants has become increasingly problematic and blurred in the European Union. While third country nationals have become target groups for mandatory integration programs, there are no publicly funded integration measures for mobile EU citizens who face many of the same cultural and social adaptation problems as other migrants do. At the same time, anti-immigrant political campaigns often treat mobile EU citizens not as free movers, but as undesirable foreign migrants, as the Brexit campaign and attacks on Roma in many EU countries have illustrated. So the result of all the phenomenon I've described so far is what we may call a migration mobility paradox. The modern state system has been designed to distinguish between migration and mobility, but current developments have eroded its capacity to uphold this distinction. This is a paradox only insofar as some basic norms of the system, such as sovereign self-determination in matters of nationality, have contributed to the very erosion. While other drivers, such as the steeply declining cost of international travel, sorry, the steeply declining costs of international travel have driven up the volume of international mobility to levels where it jeopardizes state capacities to control territorial admissions. Confronted with this blurring of the distinction between mobility and migration, uh, states are trying to respond. They're trying to respond by moving the sites of migration control away from their geographical borders. The US has, for example, established a 100-mile zone inside its territory, where border patrols can be set up uh, and where border uh, patrols can set up immigration checkpoints. And this area includes nine of the 10 largest metropolitan areas in the US. Australia has gone further by legally excising the whole of Australian territory from its so-called migration zone in 2012 which means that nobody can apply for a visa or asylum upon arrival anywhere in the Australian mainland or its offshore territories. Borders are not only folded into the territory, as these cases illustrate, they are also propelled outwards through remote control policies, ranging from passenger screening by airlines, embarkation, and running joint operations to catch both people before they reach their destinations. The effect is that, in spite of the highly visible fortification of land borders through walls and fences, borders as demarcation of jurisdictions no longer match borders as sites of control. The latter have been transformed from lines into shape-shifting zones where rights of non-citizens are generally in jeopardy. Another way in which states respond to the dilemma is by investing heavily into new technology that allows them to identify migrants, for example, through face recognition software, and to track their movements, for example, through infrared night sight cameras and mobile phone data. The use of many of these technologies is not limited to migration control, however. They originate often in military purposes, such as geopositioning systems, or in data mining technologies promoted by internet corporations. And the spillover into new forms of social and state control, affecting not only migrants, but general populations as well. The effect is that states regain some of their lost capacity to control migration, but this comes at the expense of making mobility less free for everybody, even those who enjoy free movement rights. That's the diagnosis for the first section. Now let's zoom in on Europe and uh, the current geopolitical context uh, in which migration develops. 
In a recent book that has so far been only been published in French, the American demographer Stephen Smith tells a rather frightening story. As we all know, Europe is a rapidly aging continent whose population would shrink without immigration and whose comparatively generous welfare states are under stress because of rising dependency ratios between working age populations and the elderly who live on pensions. By contrast, Africa is experiencing fast population growth and a youth bulge with 40% of the population below age 15. Young people in sub-Saharan Africa see Europe as a migration destination for four reasons. First, they have, in Smith's word, words, a vision of the world. They have mobile phones and sufficient information about better conditions for life in Europe, as well as about ways how to get there. Second, as a result of previous migration, there are growing African diasporas in European countries that provide information and support for newcomers, so that migration becomes a self-reinforcing process. Third, as migration researchers know very well, the most deprived populations lack the means for long-distance migration. But young Africans increasingly seem to find the money required to pay smugglers and traffickers to take them to Europe, which may be due to pooling of resources within families that expect better life, uh, better life through remittances, or also to a slow end onset of economic development in some countries that enables some to be sufficiently mobile to try to escape from poverty. Fourth, Africans have already become internally mobile by leaving rural backwaters and moving into the rapidly growing megacities of Africa. Young people there are often risk takers who move not only when they know that this will improve their lives, but also when they see a chance to leave behind conditions where their ambitions will be thwarted. So it is no surprise that many embark on risky and even life-threatening trips to Europe. Optimists may think that there are benefits for both sides, since Europe needs a young labor force. However, it is not at all clear that European economies have sufficient numbers of jobs to offer. Optimists will also point out that remittances can contribute to economic development in Africa that will eventually allow people to stay. Yet the remittances will flow only if migrants do find jobs. Moreover, as the migration development hump hypothesis suggests, the very onset of economic development is likely to provide more people with resources for leaving before it provides them with sufficient incentives and opportunities for staying. The drivers of future migration from Africa to Europe are thus not difficult to identify. First, fertility rate decline in most world regions except for Africa. Second, globalization shrinks the world by reducing distances for movement. Third, it narrows somewhat economic inequalities between countries while at the same time increasing inequality within countries, providing more people in poor countries with an acute sense of relative deprivation and potential opportunities. In a world of open borders, these three conditions would inevitably generate very large migration flows. Yet we do not live in such a world. States still try to control immigration, and they have powerful regulatory tools in their hands, if they have as I've discussed previously. Future migration to Europe is therefore not determined by some iron law of demographics or economics that disparities in fertility and wealth will be even out through migration flows. Migration policies matter, <coughs> and what policies will be adopted depends on the politics of migration in Europe. There are thus two kinds of migration dilemmas. The first is about migration, which migration policies to choose, and the second is about whether the right kind of policy can be adopted and implemented, given the increasingly deep political divisions running through European societies. The first is, dilemma is essentially an ethical one. The second is primarily a political one. So let me talk about the ethical dilemma first, before coming then, in the end, to the political one. 
The ethical dilemma is usually framed as one between open borders and sovereignty of states in migration control. I suggest that we need to overcome this dichotomous view. Given the scenario conjured up by Stephen Smith, it is not at all clear that open borders for immigration would contribute to global social justice instead of further enhancing social inequality within both societies of origin and destination. And, as I claimed in the first part of my talk, so sovereign self-determination over migration control is increasingly a fantasy because European states themselves have created multiple channels for freedom of movement. Moreover, the two sides of this dilemma, open borders versus sovereign migration control, can actually be bridged if we do not see free movement as an instrument for flattening economic and demographic disparities between countries, but regard it instead the flattening of such disparities as a precondition for expanding free movement. Those who value both global social justice and freedom of movement should therefore promote economic development, lower fertility rates and democratic stability in Africa, which would create the conditions for relaxing immigration control and expanding channels of mobility between the continents. In that approach, migration is not the answer, but it can still contribute to both goals, but only if it is regulated and regulated in the right way. I don't know what the, what the right principles and tools for policies of economic development, demographic stabilization and democratic consolidation are that European states should adopt in their relations with African societies. This is beyond my competence. But I have some ideas what the right ethical principles for European migration policies might be. So let me talk about these. The first one is to distinguish between different admission claims. Opportunity-seeking migrants are different from refugees seeking protection and from those seeking to be reunited with their family members. Of course, one and the same person may have all three motives. A refugee will naturally seek protection in a country where she will also enjoy opportunities to rebuild her life and where family members of hers have settled previously. But my point is that the moral claims that the three types of migrants have to be admitted are fundamentally different and should result in different admission channels. This becomes obvious once we adopt an international perspective and ask which state has a duty to admit whom. Consider first family reunification. Family members have a human right to be reunited. But the anchor person who has been admitted previously has a more specific right to family reunification in this country rather than in the country of origin. Family migration is thus essentially a membership-based claim towards particular countries. By contrast, refugees have a claim to protection of their fundamental rights but they do not have to prove a prior connection to the country of destination where they claim asylum. Where there are special connections because of prior migration flows, historical ties, maybe also the involvement of outside countries in the violence triggering the refugee crisis, or because of mere geographic proximity, these states will have stronger responsibility than others. But generally, providing asylum is a duty of all states a refugee convention, and the burdens of refugee protection must therefore be distributed fairly and widely across them. So the difficult question is, do states also have duties to admit economic migrants? And I suggest that they do, if admission generates a triple win. That is, if it creates benefits for the migrant, the country of origin and the receiving country. For some, such a principle may seem too weak. It is a minimalist principle that migration should be admitted if everyone would be better off as a result. Why should we strive only for Pareto optimal improvement, as the economists would call it, rather than a fair distribution of the benefits between the three categories of agents involved? One reason is that it seems very hard to say what the standards of fairness would be in this case. Since we are considering migration between independent countries, there are also no institutions that could guarantee a fair distribution of benefits. Others may regard a triple win principle as much too demanding. 
It does indeed rule out most of the current economic immigration policies in the North that have aimed to skim off skilled migrants, shifting the costs of education and training to countries of origin without taking into account brain drain effects on these countries. Yet the principle also rules out economic migration as an instrument for international poverty relief. Political philosopher Robert Goodin suggested such an approach in already in 19, 1992. And here's a quote. If we cannot move enough money to where the needy people are, then we will have to count on moving as many of the needy people as possible to where the money is. Such a policy might not only be inefficient in alleviating po poverty in countries of origin, it would also conflict with requirements of democratic legitimacy in receiving states whose governments have a special responsibility to promote social justice domestically, just as the governments of sending countries do. Finally, the triple win principle rules also out exploiting migrants for the sake of greater benefits of either the source or the destination country. It would, for example, not allow for temporary migration policies that keep migrants dependent on employers and deny them prospects of secure residence, equal rights, and eventually access to citizenship. The triple win principle provides thus, I suggest, a critical standard for current economic migration policies. But it does not support a policy of free movement and open borders for economic migrants. In order to meet these standards, migrants will have to be selected and managed by states. And in order to prevent that economic migration programs are dominated by the interests of wealthy receiving countries, they should be managed jointly by sending and receiving states, together with organizations representing the interests of migrants vis-a-vis -vis both. The principle supports thus calls for international and global governance of migration. Although it aims at benefits for all involved, this goal can be cannot be realistically achieved by states acting in pursuit of their self-interest without having to take the other affected interests into account. So, I think the UN Global Compact on Orderly and Regular Migration is a tiny little step in that direction. It doesn't give away much, uh, but it signals at least that you need international cooperation and governance in order to turn irregular forms of migration into regular forms. And the, condition, the ethical condition for this to work, I suggest, is the triple win principle. In contrast with family reunification or asylum, economic migrants do not have individual claims for admission. States have to run programs that offer migration opportunities to sufficient numbers, and the procedures for selecting individuals must be transparent and non-discriminatory. But would-be migrants who are not admitted under these conditions cannot complain that their rights have been violated. So how would these principles then apply to migration from Africa to Europe? They would entail opening up sufficiently wide channels for regular economic migration. These should have the effect of curbing somewhat the demand for trafficking and of unclogging asylum systems by opening duties to admit far below the number of those who are interested and motivated to migrate. Moreover, the absence of individual admission claims in such programs means that those who do not get a place in an economic migration quota cannot claim that their rights have been violated. So what will then be the effect of frustrated migration hopes? We don't know. But certainly it will not be worse than the devastating impact of current European policies in fighting irregular migration from Africa. A lot of pressure is going to remain in any case. But potentially, the incentives provided by a well-designed economic migration program could even be beneficial for those who are not admitted, if they develop their skills to improve their migration prospects and employ them subsequently in their countries of origin. This is still a fairly moderately optimistic outlook. Let me now conclude with the third uh, and shorter part that becomes much more skeptical, which is about the political conditions for implementing such, as I think, rational and ethical migration policies. <laughs> 
Normative theorists have discussed the dilemma that global justice requires open borders, while democracy requires immigration control. And they've been discussing this since the early 1980s. In summer 2015, this philosophical problem was enacted as a political drama on the European stage. When the German and Swedish governments decided not to implement the Dublin regulation by pushing back refugees at their borders towards states of transit and first entry, they responded to a widespread view, also among their own citizens, that admitting these people was first of all a humanitarian duty. Chancellor Merkel's policy has often been driven by reading opinion polls. And I don't think her much criticized statement, wir schaffen das, we can handle this, was an exception. But the humanitarian framing of the issue was eventually defeated in the public debate by an alternative view, that this was a security and a membership question, and more specifically, an issue of cultural belonging rather than primarily of limited resources for social and economic integration. The refugees from war zones in Syria and Afghanistan were going to stay, and if borders remained open for further inflows, host societies would no longer be able to cope. In Germany, the turning point was New Year's Eve in Cologne, when young North Africans, not Syrian refugees, mobbed together and sexually harassed German women. The new framing of refugee admission as a security and cultural and membership issue gave the upper hand to those political forces that had already framed all kinds of immigration in this way for a long time. And under increasing pressure from populist challenger parties, centrist governments in Austria, Germany and Sweden quickly agreed that they had to regain control over immigration from the Middle East and Africa. The political earthquakes that triggered this policy shift buried under the rubble also those rational as well as ethical policies that had previously been at least on the European agenda, even if the proposals and initial decisions had been deficient in many respects. These included complementing the common European asylum system with a mandatory scheme for responsibility sharing for refugee protection among EU member states. And intentions to open up new channels for regular economic migration from sub-Saharan African countries. The advocates of restoring state sovereignty won this battle, partly because the other side lacked a political vision beyond the humanitarian response that would address the membership question and promote different channels for refugees and for regular and controlled migration. Eventually, the sovereignists, if we can call them like this, could even claim the moral high ground for themselves by arguing that no entry policies and turnbacks to Libyan detention centers would save lives by deterring African migrants from risking to cross the Mediterranean. Since the 1990s, Europe's free movement regime had spilled over into migration control by pushing member states towards harmonization and eventually joint external border controls, as well as European standards on asylum, family unification and the rights and legal status of long-term resident third country nationals. Now, the capture of public opinion and the political agenda by sovereignists has led to a backlash against free movement with border controls inside the Schengen era area being maintained without any evidence of current public order threats that could justify them. Because of the pre previous blurring of the distinction between migration and mobility that I've talked uh, about in the beginning, it turns out now that one cannot reassert national control over immigration without also restricting mobility inside the EU. The political ideology driving the Trump's administration's foreign and trade policy, the Brexiteers' gamble, and continental European border closures, pursues always the same goal. The nation state must take back control that it has lost due to globalization. It must take back control over immigration, as well as from international and supranational institutions. This aim may be a chimera, but chasing the chimera can severely set back efforts to find cooperative solutions to global problems, such as climate change, the emergence of global monopolies in the digital economy, or international migration and refugee protection. A recent example is the withdrawal of the US, the Hungarian and the Austrian governments from the draft UN Global Compact for safe, orderly and regular migration, 
which is currently triggering a domino effect of additional cancellations. But how did get Europe into a situation where rational and ethical migration policies can no longer be defended publicly? And where centrist parties feel they have to pander to the rhetoric of closure to prevent a further erosion of their electorate towards the populist right, and in some countries also the populist left of the political spectrum. One answer suggested by political scientists studying public opinion and electoral behavior is that the old left-right axis along which voters and parties have aligned for more than two centuries, no longer fully structures the political space. There is a new cleavage between citizens whose political values focus on how open or closed societies should be. Attitudes become then polarized on issues of globalization, European integration, international governance and migration. And parties that represent the opposite poles of this new axis can successfully compete with centrist parties that are aligned on the left-right axis but find it difficult to take a coherent position on the open-closed axis. The voters attracted by cosmopolitan or nationalist values have different social profiles, with the former being younger and better educated while the latter tend to be older and with lower educational degrees. This is what we know. The sheer demographic weight of old voters in, Europe, uh, in Europe's societies gives nationalist positions potentially more clout. It is the new cleavage, if the new cleavage were only about class and demography, there might still be ways how to bridge it, in similar ways as the divides between left and right have been bridged in the past, through proportional representation systems in elections, through grand coalition governments in some countries, and through cooperation between political elites that have vested interests in stable institutions. These traditional solutions are premised on the idea that differences of class and political values are contained and can be managed within a political space that is shared by all citizens. The problem is that the new cleavage focuses on different visions of the political community and it's also associated with personal experiences of mobility. Those advocating more open societies often regard Europe as the wide, or the, even the wider world as their natural space of opportunities. And they often have experiences, not just of traveling, but also studying or working within that space. Those who want the nation state to take back control experience mobility beyond the national borders not as an opportunity, but as a threat to their values and ways of life. If there is no common vision of the political space within which political cleavages can be institutionally mediated and bridged, what hope is left for a democratic consensus on migration policies which most strongly articulate and polarize the two views? It is almost as if the two sides did not only live in different spaces, but had also different views of the world that we still all share. For one side, it consists of sovereign nation states that compete with each other externally and represent internally clearly defined nations that must remain distinct, that must remain in control over newcomers in order to re retain their distinct identities. For the other side, states are just one level of democratic government and they have become too interdependent and also too small to resolve many of the most urgent global problems. They thus need to be complemented with global governance regimes and supranational institutions at the regional level and should also transfer powers to local governments that are better equipped to manage social integration in highly mobile and super diverse societies than states are. You may have guessed that the latter is also my own vision of the world. Yet as a Democrat, I also believe that it cannot be imposed by enlightened elites on those who do not share it. It must instead be fought and argued for in political arenas. And this is where the task of academic reflection ends and that of democratic politics begins. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rainer, for this enlightening and <laughs> interesting talk about Europe and its its future probably I would say <laughs>
Um, I would like to open the floor for questions, and um, I start myself with the first question. What about Sweden? <laughs> I sort of <laughs> took it up at the end of my introduction. I, uh, I want to start with that you reflect a little bit on partly that what has happened uh, is not just <laughs> 2015 and the, the large inflow of asylum seekers to Europe. It has been going on for a number of years, probably a couple of decades, I would say, by not only um, that we are struggling, European states, uh, about migration when it comes to citizenship rules, uh, which Sweden has not adjusted to, I would say, and, uh, and also when it comes to migration at our borders, you could say, how many and who do we let in? Uh, and I would think would like you to reflect on the the current political situation as you also um, refer to um, what, what what are we going to um, to get um, in the end here <coughs> so uh, Sweden uh, for a long time in the fields that I study also empirically was considered to be a best case uh, when it comes to, uh, for example, the proportion between uh, refugees and labor migrants, Sweden took on proportionally more refugees uh, compared to labor migrants than uh, the other countries that had guest worker policies and were very reluctant to open asylum channels. Sweden also was definitely more inclusive than many other European countries when it came to granting settled immigrants, uh, legal rights and status. So already in the mid-1970s, Sweden introduced a policy that uh, my friend and, and mentor, Thomas Hammer, had called the policy of uh, creating denizens, uh, quasi-citizens, where you, uh, people who had long-term residence after five years would enjoy most of the rights that traditionally had been a privilege of citizens, uh, including the right to vote, uh, in local elections, where Sweden was a pioneer in Europe that then triggered similar reforms in other countries uh, in the 80s and 1990s. And finally, with regard to citizenship, I would have also a more generous view than maybe Peter. You know, looking at uh, the Swedish citizenship law, and I compare and collect and study citizenship laws around the world, uh, Sweden seems to be one of the best cases. Sweden uh, generally uh, gives uh, access to uh, naturalization after five years, under, still under conditions where there are no language uh, and civic knowledge tests, so that might change. Um, uh, it has, uh, doesn't have uh, a strong income requirement, so many other countries uh, close their doors to citizenship if you ever have been dependent on welfare and cannot prove that you have sufficient income. Uh, and uh, it grants citizenship to the next generation uh, who came as minors with their parents or was born in Sweden, not on grounds of use solely. No, birth and the territory doesn't matter in Sweden, but uh, you can achieve citizenship by declaration. A parent just has to declare that a minor child has lived in Sweden for five years and they get citizenship without any other requirements. And that is very, very inclusive in European and also in global comparison. I think Sweden also uh, did the right thing on the other side, on how many people you include on the outside. I mentioned that one of the big drivers of, potential drivers of free movement rights is European countries granting citizenship based on their ancestry to the descendants you know, of uh, emigrant grandparents, right? Uh, Spain uh, and, and, and Italy are the obvious cases, but Romania and many other countries have similar policies. Sweden requires that those who were born outside Sweden, to Swedish parents, if they want to retain their Swedish citizenship, they have to re-establish their connections with Sweden at some point, you know, uh, uh, I think at age 21 or so. And again, you might say that prevents uh, Sweden from generating free movement migrants that have no connection to Europe coming to the European Union with a Swedish passport. So uh, on, on all these counts, that's on the plus side. Now, I haven't studied uh, in depth uh, socioeconomic integration and cultural integration patterns. But the story that I pick up 
from people who study this, including here in Malmö, <laughs> uh, is that Sweden may not be the most successful case in terms of uh, creating, uh, for example, um, let, let's take an indicator also is problematic inter-ethnic marriages, right? Tend to be higher in other countries than in Sweden. So there seems to be there seem to be social exclusion mechanisms, also self exclusion mechanisms, not just exclusion by the Swedish society, that are quite strong and probably have uh, strong culturally based uh, mechanisms. Where Sweden, uh, you know, has been generous in terms of rights and status, but less successful in making immigrants feel that they can truly be Swedes in all ways, culturally, socially, in, in every, every sort. So, what happens now when Sweden suddenly is experiencing the same breakdown of the traditional parties, which I think is the real cause of the politics dilemma that I've been talking about. Uh, and a rising party that ca goes into that void and mobilizes the anti-immigrant vote. And I think Sweden just shows how difficult it is for a party system that was so clearly structured along the left-right axis to respond to the new open-closed cleavage and uh, for the traditional parties to take a coherent stance and to say that, look, we have to be more aggressively defending the openness of Swedish society and the reason probably why this didn't happen to Sweden to the extent that I would have hoped for is that Sweden also felt left alone uh, in, on the European stage. Uh, that there was this uh, perception that the other countries are not willing to share responsibility, especially for refugees. The other countries are not willing to go forward with serious economic migration programs, programs as alternatives. So we risk being a magnet, you know, for those who take the other channels because these channels are closed by other states. And this is, in a way, makes it explicable, also maybe not perfectly justifiable, why also a country like Sweden changes its policy in a quite dramatic way and uh, turns towards closure. Really problematic is it when that becomes then an ideology, you know, when it is then justified, when the mainstream parties then hop on the bandwagon and say, we need to take back control for the nation state. Because anybody who looks at this seriously will know, this is a lost game. The nation state cannot be in control of migration just as it cannot be in control of global climate change. It can only, control can only be exercised jointly, you know, in, uh, in, and, and not individually by, by the states. If the states do it individually, they will do it against each other and they will divert the migrations to the other states and uh, that will lead to ever more deeper forms of closure that will have an impact on the migration flows. So migration has come down since 2015. But the price for this is also the price that European societies pay in terms of a loss of their own liberty, including rights of freedom of movement. A very long answer. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the floor? Thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm, I'm interested in your concluding point about how there's a political solution in sharing power between the local and the supranational. I was wondering if you can elaborate on how such a supranational regime would look. Are we talking global? In that case, would the UN suffice or, or is it more regional and in terms kind of like the EU or, um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, th thanks for this question. So let me talk briefly about both the supranational and the local, the level below and above the, the state. Let's start with the supranational one. So what, what I, I, I think there is an urgent need to develop norms at the global level. And the UN compact uh, is one step in that direction. There will be another compact on refugees that is currently drafted by the UNHCR that also aims for developing norms in international relations uh, that states are asked to uh, follow. It's not legally binding, uh, but it's at least guidelines for state cooperation in the areas of refugee. That's very important. But at the global level, 
there is a dearth of institutions that could actually uh, strengthen the implementation of such norms, uh, monitor them and hold states to account. First, it's difficult to translate the guidelines into legally binding norms. It's very difficult to make stand states sign up to legally binding norms. And it's even more difficult to uh, have institutions such as international courts that will then sanction states when they violate legal norms. Uh, and given all these difficulties, I think it is very important to step one level down and to strengthen regional uh, regimes. And uh, here my suggestion was also in this talk that the impetus could come from uh, the uh, domestic concerns of states in some world regions to establish free movement regimes for their own citizens. So in Europe, this is how it happened. You know, Europe didn't invent the European Union in order to have a joint policy on third country nationals, uh, immigration or refugees. It invented EU, EU citizenship in order to have free movement, not just for capital and, uh, and goods and services, but also for people. But the consequence of establishing such an EU citizenship and the right of free movement was that they had to harmonize external border controls, open up internal borders, and talk about the common uh, European asylum system and common policies also and standards uh, towards third country nationals that are far higher than what would be possible on the international scale. Now, my hope is that uh, similar things could develop in different ways in other parts of the world. Um, it, in, in you see it most uh, obviously in South America. Mercosur and also UNASUR, uh, the larger entity, right? are both committed to promoting free movement on that continent. Uh, and they are talking about an UNASUR or Mercosur citizenship that would also entrench this as a right. And that would be a right granted to the nationals of the members of the club, but it would probably have the same side effects as in Europe, that they have to think seriously about what to do with third country nationals uh, who uh, might want to migrate to South America. So, and even ECOWAS, this is the most surprising story, you know, Western Africa, who would think about this, where it's probably partly driven by the insight that states cannot effectively control their borders, so they better engage in a free movement regime because of lack of capacity to do anything else. But it, it, at least, even if it's only lip service, the idea that ECOWAS states would grant each, other, uh, each other's uh, citizens free movement rights, I think drives a dynamic that could have positive effects also for rational and ethical policies on migration and immigrant admission, uh, more generally speaking. Uh, so that's on the supranational level. On the local level, uh, now I can finally also talk about Malmö. I've been uh, you know, <laughs> pushed a little bit to do this. <laughs> Maybe not about Malmö, but just the local level of government. Yeah? So local, uh, the local level of government for me is also a, a relevant level of democratic self-government. So uh, municipalities in democracies have uh, citizens of their own because they have elections and bodies that are elected by these citizens and are in charge of local affairs. And the question is, who are the citizens at the municipal level? For states, it's very clear that they have to distinguish between the nationals and the non-nationals. And only the nationals can vote and are represented in the parliament. Right? Also, the non-nationals will all be subjected to the laws that are made by these parliaments. For the, uh, at the municipal level, that doesn't look plausible at all. And Sweden's pioneering step in 75 to introduce local voting it just shows that they understood somehow that question, that at the local level, membership is really a question of residence. If you are a resident of Malmö, you are a citizen of Malmö, no matter what country you have come from and what passport you have. Because the city of Malmö has the task of providing public services to all its residents. And if it failed in this task by saying, oh, you know, you are a national, you are not a national, then uh, it would be a, a badly governed municipality, right? It has to be inclusive in that way. Uh, and the most important point is municipalities don't have immigration control rights. They don't have the power. They have no borders where they could possibly establish border controls and say who comes in. They are forced by states to be open. You know, this is when, when states in a way cr uh, created internal mobility and promoted it by tearing down the walls of the old medieval cities in Europe, right? 
uh, but because they have they know that they don't have immigration control they have a different yeah, municipal governments often have a different attitude towards what to do with the migrants and the attitude is generally a more inclusive one because this is what they need to do if they want to govern the municipality well now having said this again it would be naive to think that there is no politics going on at the local level uh, I've lived for 11 years in Italy and in Italy there are several cities that were captured by the right-wing extremists of the Lega uh, who uh, the first thing they did is was to uh, establish anti-immigrant policies to close down the Roma camps and to fingerprint all the Roma there and to uh, you know do whatever they can to signal that this city is not for immigrants but that is in a way going against the grain of what the city is in, in modern democracy. It is an open space, also an open space for immigration from the outside. It's the state task to control and select and regulate immigration from the outside, not the city's task. And therefore the city is in a way freer to develop uh, integration policies that are uh, you know, considering the diversity of the populations that uh, they have to serve. Uh, so again, I think there is, this is why I was suggesting that it's so important that we don't consider states as the only game in town. That we try to complement uh, uh, what states can do and have to do, for example, in running asylum programs and economic migration programs. That's the task that only the state can fulfill, right? Uh, but to complement this with uh, supranational and uh, local levels of government and to see what tasks they can do that are different from states and sometimes these will clash so in in the us now there is a big clash the clash is about sanctuary cities this is cities that refuse refuse to cooperate with us immigration authorities who want to deport irregular migrants right uh, they just uh, say that no we don't uh, notify the immigration authority when uh, such a person comes to the city and consumes an urban service, right? Uh, and uh, Donald Trump is up in arms against this, right? And he says, this is violating the rule of law. No, it's not. You know, it's actually very cautiously framed within the rule of law in America, but it's also an, ex an exemplary uh, illustration of the dis different perspectives that city governments and national governments have on the phenomenon of migration. Cities very often uh, see these populations as belonging in, even if, from a state perspective, they are ir irregular and don't belong. And therefore, the two governments, the two levels will clash when it comes to enforcing deportation. Next question. <coughs> I hope I don't out myself that I wasn't listening close enough. Um, could you give a, a couple of more examples for triple win scenarios you were advocating for and um, what that concretely could mean in, uh, for, for labor migration and how that maybe changes as well then over time? So has it does, do you advocate a triple win right away or a prospective triple win if someone gets educated here going back later and shares that knowledge in there? And how do you play with time in between because life sometimes goes a bit differently than when you enter the border and plan what to do? Thanks. Yep. Thanks. So uh, I'm not sure I have a ready-made answer for that question because that's also you know, the part of my talk that I hadn't really elaborated before in other research or writing, so I'm, it's in a way more speculative. But the way I think about this is, on the one hand, starting from something that most economists would say, which is that migration can produce triple wins. So it, it's not a zero-sum game, that, that's the message. Migration can be simultaneously uh, beneficial for the country of origin, the country of destination and the migrant. Right? Uh, and that raises then, secondly, the question what are the conditions under which this would be possible? And here, I, in a way, I turn normative and say, well, the condition is that uh, there must be regulations that uh, make sure that none of the three sides loses out. Right? So, um, and, and that would entail that then you then look at what are the scenarios in which one of the sides loses out. And there I just listened them, uh, I listed them. One is, uh, where, uh, obviously, where the receiving countries just uh, use uh, immigrant labor 
uh, in a way that is exploitative of the country of origin. This is the so-called brain drain. Now, it is important to know that the brain drain is not universally happening. Sometimes even the skilled immigration from countries of origin may be beneficial to the countries of origin. A good example is the Philippines, they uh, have specialized for a long time in uh, health uh, professionals, right? So they have produced nurses for export, right? assuming that this would be very good for the Philippine economy. It's not that the Philippine medical system is breaking down because of all these Filipino nurses working abroad. Uh, they think actually it's benefiting for them, they have a good education and training, uh, they create the right kind of skills for the European and American markets, and these nurses, once they find employment, send back remittances, and uh, everybody uh, will benefit in that system if it's run well. But maybe I'm naive about the Philippine system, but I think an ideal, typical system of triple win could be portrayed in, in these ways. The, uh, the other possible, the other injunction what should not happen under triple win is that the destination country lo uh, loses out. That's also important to say, and I'm sometimes a little bit politically incorrect, but this is why I rejected this quote from Robert Goodin that says, oh, let's transfer the poverty. Uh, from uh, from Africa to Europe, uh, and some people will say that this is poetic justice. You know, Europe. The, actually, the book of Stephen Smith is the title of Stephen Smith's book, "The Scramble for Europe," is a nice play on the scramble for Africa, which was the motto for European uh, uh, states to uh, rush and establish their own colonies in Africa, which was one of the most disastrous experiences in humankind because it led to a collapse of the African demography. You know, the decline of population is tremendous. De population decline in Africa because of European colonialism. Uh, and now some people say, okay, now Africa is growing demographically and they want to come to Europe. That's poetic justice. You have to repay your debt from the 19th century. But the problem is, you know, the people who did it are no longer alive and the people who will pay the debt now are different ones. Uh, and it's also not clear that transferring poverty will be helpful for the country of origin. It might actually leave behind those that are worst off, right? Because they don't have the resources to move. So uh, that would be a second implication that you look closely uh, at also what happens, what can be argued as being democratically legitimate in the country of destination. This is where democracy comes in. Because you must be able to explain to voters why it would be good for them to admit economic migrants, if even if, unlike the family members and the refugees, these people don't have individual claims to be admitted. It's a duty to have an immigration quota policy, but it's not a duty towards the individuals who are selected within the quota to admit them. So this is harder to sell to voters, and the only way you can sell it, also from a normative perspective, is by saying, look, our country is going to benefit. Maybe not on your terms, because there will be cultural change. But in demographic and economic terms, there may be benefits, and we can show what they are if this is a well-regulated system, and Europe needs it actually, right? And finally, it should not be exploitative of the migrants themselves, and many, especially temporary labor programs, right, may actually be beneficial both for the country of origin and destination, but not for the migrants themselves. Uh, and again, that must be avoided, you know, the kind of exploitation that goes on in, in these programs and where people get stuck in these programs without ever being able to rebuild their lives either at home uh, or at, at origin or in the destination. This is all I can improvise, you know, on, on, uh, on that. But I think uh, it's, uh, some, some people think this is, you know, as a normative theorist, why would you buy into a logic of, of triple win? I think for economic migration, this is the right logic. Uh, at least my, my argument drives me to that conclusion. Let me hop in then again. Yeah, sure. So I, I, I was wondering, uh, last, uh, a couple of weeks ago I was on a, on a migration conference in Sydney, the so-called Metropolis Conference. And um, there, um, um, when being in Australia, they, they claim that they are this multicultural society. 
And, <laughs> and there are actually a few left now that claim that they, politically at least, that they are still multicultural societies. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and then you probably you have it. So I was thinking about this, this sovereign wave, as you call it, the period, that we have more people that are sort of want to close the borders. Um, if you then listen to the, what's happening in Australia, as you said yourself also, on one side they claim that they're a multicultural society, but, but not for refugees. Then we keep them out of the, uh, um, we keep them on the islands, and, and they, um, there are terrible his histories about those, um, how these uh, refugees, uh, especially also children, are kept. Uh, New Zealand uh, is easy to be a multicultural society because people leave actually the country, so they have more emigration than immigration. So, so, so it's, it's um, they really want to promote themselves still because they need people uh, to the country. And then we are only left with one country, and that's sort of Canada. Is this the only ca country where we can team up with if we want to have a more pluralist society, a society that promotes migration or see migration as a sort of an asset in, in all kind of ways. Yeah, Australia and Canada are interesting cases. And uh, Australia uh, was recently praised by the Federal Chancellor of, of Austria, Sebastian Kurz, uh, as the model to follow. Huh? Uh, this was already in 2015, 16, where I said they understood, you know, how to deal with uh, boat people and asylum seekers. Keep them out of the territory. Don't let them enter and file asylum claims here. And that will reduce the number of people who drown in the sea, trying to get uh, in and, and uh, see this as an immigration route. The Australian model has another side that Austria and the European Union generally doesn't have, which is first, as you say, it's a self-proclaimed multicultural society, also with its drawbacks. If you look at how the Australians have historically and still treat uh, their Aborigines, it's uh, one of the most shocking stories, uh, you know, in, in, in complete failure of integration and acknowledgement and recognition. Uh, much worse than uh, indigenous peoples in Canada, for example. Uh, secondly, uh, Australia does have uh, both immigration and refugee policies that are quite admirable in many ways, as long as it remains in control. So, you, uh, you know, the, the numbers of immigrants in Australia per head, I think, are even larger than in Canada today, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that includes resettled refugees. So refugees that Australia selects uh, in refugee camps and they try to match the skills with what is needed in Australia, and then they take them in. And that's completely fine with Australia's self-understanding as a nation of immigrants. Huh? What is impossible to accept and even to argue in Australia is that Australia, even in Australia, distances have shrunk to neighboring countries and that produce refugees, and people come in in other ways. Uh, they may come in by boat, and want to claim asylum, and you are obliged under the Geneva Convention to examine their asylum claims. And Australia is denying that responsibility by sending them to offshore islands, outsourcing uh, this to even neighboring uh, Pacific Island states, where the, the, the conditions are terrible, but they are meant to be terrible in the detention centers uh, in order to create a deterrence effect. So that people don't come upon the idea that you can enter Australia and claim asylum uh, there. However, even in Australia, I think uh, roughly 50% of the people who eventually get regular immigrant status came as tourists and overstayed their visa. So the, the fantasy of complete border control you know, is a fantasy even in Australia. Compare this with Europe, you know, where the geopolitical context is so different. You know, we don't have this large sea. We, the Mediterranean Sea has become a lake. You know, it, uh, it's still a terrible lake to cross for many people, but it's, uh, it's historically and geographically in so many ways so connected to Europe that you cannot imagine that we just close it off and uh, say whoever crosses it without our authorization won't be even considered as having a valid claim. 
So that, that is a lesson that the Australians still haven't learned because we have to understand that the settler nations, Australia, Canada, the US, also in most uh, countries in South America, they, this is built in their historic identity that we are an immigrant nation that selects the immigrants it wants to build the nation. Right? And the, the truth is in the context of globalization that is no longer possible in the same way if the nation wants to do it on its own. So uh, I think that goes also for Canada in, in some ways. Canada has, again, a geographically rather isolated position with the US in between. It's not so easy to sail to Canada and claim asylum there. Uh, but there are people coming through across the US-Canadian border and it causes worries in, in Canada. And I was recently discussing this with a Canadian colleague and said, well, shall we see, look at your country as the last remaining shining example in the world that does accept uh, not only that it's multicultural and an immigrant nation and has a good economic immigration problem, but does also accept uh, asylum seekers. And she said, don't bet on it. You know, even with the current liberal government, uh, the mood is going the other way. Uh, so uh, Australia and Canada are still trying to cope with the problem in a context where they're not part of a regional as a club where they could do it jointly together. NAFTA was never like this and now it's even you know, renamed and, and changed by, by Trump in a way that makes it clear this will never be about free movement of labor. right? Uh, Australia isn't part of any club of that kind, uh, except for New Zealand where there is the uh, travel arrangement. Uh, so that deprives states of the capacity to come up with joint solutions, which I think are possible uh, to invent uh, in Europe. Uh, and, and in South America, and maybe in, in West Africa. So I think we should see this as not as a European deficit, but as a European strength, that Euro European states can handle this problem only through cooperation, and they have the institutional preconditions for cooperation. You know, the, the real shame of the breakdown of the common European asylum system in 2015 was that this was the best case scenario in terms of what it takes to have a system of responsibility sharing between states admitting asylum seekers. You could argue there is a common territory, uh, there is already external border control that is jointly exercised, there is an institution uh, that, that takes, there are institutions that take care of this, uh, including Frontex there. Uh, the, the norms for how to treat asylum seekers, how to determine their claims, all of this was already there. Even under these conditions, European states could not agree on a relocation scheme. Uh, that's really shocking. That's one of the most shocking failures, I think, in the European Union's history. But it does not mean that it's not possible in any case. I think it was not possible because of politics, not because the policies were not, not available. The policies were actually being discussed. I think some of the policies were stupid. I think, for example, that the way the relocation scheme was set up was wrong because there is no point sending uh, refugees to countries that don't want to have them and where they don't want to go. So uh, that's not a solution. You know? uh, the solution would have been to say that it's about responsibility sharing and not only about relocation. And if a country is not willing to uh, take in refugees, then it must be willing to fund the other countries that take in refugees in exactly that proportion that its negative preferences on uh, uh, refugees imposed as, as a cost on the countries that take them in. And countries would have changed their mind, you know, if the, if the costs would have gone up for funding the other countries that do take in refugees. It would say, oh yes, we'd rather have refugees rather than contribute that much to the budget, right? So, uh, the, the, you know, there are even the economic solutions to that problem that uh, were just not seriously discussed because the debate was reframed as one about national control. <coughs> And we have the, the global compact now, uh, uh, the two compacts you mentioned. Uh, but I think it, tied up in it, in the perception of many citizens, is the, the whole <laughs> underbelly of, of this, uh, and that is the, the people who are involved in, in human trafficking. Uh, uh, would you have some comments about that? Uh, 
So draw is with uh, drug trafficking. You know, I'm not talking about refugees as equivalent to drugs, but uh, the economics that creates a business of traffic, trafficking and, and smuggling human beings and, uh, traf uh, and smuggling drugs is maybe not entirely different. And uh, one answer that you know, we know from US history is abolition created a criminal business you know, <laughs> in uh, smuggling alcohol, for example. And it's not so different for American, uh, the American war on drugs. The American war on drugs uh, created a market for criminal organizations in Mexico and Central America that was not there before. So if by a similar logic, a policy of border closure in a context where people are sufficiently motivated and have sufficient means to try to cross the border even if it's closed, uh, that means they will have to rely on services. And the services are illegal ones since they help them to commit an illegal act of crossing a border that they are not entitled to cross. And therefore a business emerges for smuggling and trafficking people. And the more you invest into tightening the border uh, with technological means, the more violence is exercised you know, in controlling the border, the more violence will go into that business of human trafficking. Uh, the criminal organizations will become nastier because they enforce higher costs on their clients. They have to retrieve uh, their debts through debt collectors that can be pretty nasty. And they will take, they will be less careful in uh, with the lives of their clients. You know, if the clients are desperate enough, right, uh, uh, they will be willing to lead them also into death traps assuming that there are enough other people who don't care and who will still buy their services. Uh, and, and the mindset of, the, of the, the bosses in the trafficking business are the mindsets of, of, of people leading criminal organizations. They see an opportunity to earn a lot of money through an, an illegal business. I would still make a distinction between uh, the people lower down the chain. So where, what we very often learn also from ethnographers who study irregular migration is that uh, the local people and the people who help them on the next stage of the route, you know, are very often decent people who want to earn a buck alongside, right? Because they live miserably otherwise. They are not part of criminal organizations in a, in a deep way. You know, they provide services uh, and sometimes they even help the migrants, you know, uh, alongside uh, and, and prevent them from uh, dehydration in the desert or drowning uh, uh, in the sea. And this is, in a way, the older spirit that uh, was tried to, you know, that, that states escalation, you know, the, 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 it's like an arms race, you know, the escalation of the border control. Uh, killed off to a certain extent, or tried to kill off. This is smuggling rather than trafficking. Just like uh, you know, with uh, uh, avoiding uh, customs control for things that are not like drugs. You know, it's a very old profession, right? <laughs> smuggling, yeah, and it's illegal. But it, uh, when this was a small business, in a way, you didn't need big criminal organizations to run it. Local people could do it on, the, on either side of the border. They engaged in this, right? They made the border porous because they knew where the gaps in state control was. The more the states closed this down, the more they hand over power to the big guys who are really sharks, right? And not like the local smugglers who uh, for a fee will help the people uh, across the border. So criminalizing some parts of this business is uh, dangerous, actually. It might endanger more lives, and, uh, and it's not a way how you can undercut uh, the business itself. I think, yes, it's true, you know, if you uh, deter people really by no longer rescuing them when they drown in the sea, then fewer people might take the trip, and therefore traffickers might lose some of their business. They will find other routes. You know, these are highly mobile uh, organizations that will look for opportunities around the world where they could do set up the, uh, their, their next business. Uh, but uh, for the, uh, the, I think the only long-term perspective of undercutting the business of the traffickers is opening up regular migration channels. Right? 
And this is why we need this so desperately. It's not just because it would provide triple win for everybody. It could, but because also it might help save lives. There is still a humanitarian reason for doing this, right? Also, humanitarianism, as I said, is not a sufficient reason. Yeah. We have our last question, or just a closure? A closure, yeah. because I really wanted to ask you something that I was thinking of that I should stay away from, but I will, I will not... Yeah, I think I should ask you that. But now we're over time, so... You can also say that we, we need a longer dialogue around this, because we have spent most of the day talking about global citizenship. And when I hear you talking about a uh, no sovereign way of solving some sort of way, but I, I think when you hear, I just want you to tell me, what do you think of when you hear global citizenship? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is something I think about a lot. <laughs> uh, and. Uh, I'll give a talk about this tomorrow in Stockholm. <laughs> uh, I have to go there. Com com completely different, no. But uh, I'm, I'm, I've become increasingly skeptical of the idea that global citizenship could be or should be anything like national citizenship uh, or even supranational citizenship in the Union is now. Uh, in other words, I'm not a fan of the world state, right? Uh, I, I'm, uh, but this is a long philosophical discussion, right? It starts with Immanuel Kant and his objections against the world state. But uh, I, I do think there is a sense that we can give to global citizenship that would make it something different. So I'm entirely in favor of global citizenship if it means a moral attitude, right? Rather than a legal status and a set of rights where you elect a global parliament uh, and the government that has power to rule the world, which I find an abhorrent idea for freedom. But uh, uh, as a moral attitude, I'm a cosmopolitan, right? Uh, and I think also you could uh, develop elements of global citizenship uh, in the way that, for example, you could say that let's set standards for national citizenship at the global level. And this is what I will be talking about tomorrow. So states determine who their citizens are. But it's absurd that they can determine this without global standards. Uh, for example, on whom they have to include in order to perform as states in good standing in the international system of states. And there are some international norms, very few. Again, there is hope for the regional level. In Europe, there is a European Convention on Nationality of 1997. That is globally the most advanced standard on saying what states should do in, if they want to respect human rights in their nationality laws no gender, racial discrimination, etc., and uh, no more than 10 years of residence requirements for naturalization. That I would hope for at the global level, and if you call that global citizenship, that's fine with me. Thank you. Very nice. Um, now, as a part of what we have been doing today, we have, of course, celebrated Malmö University's 20th anniversary. Oh, yeah, so yes. we would like to provide it with a... And I was thinking, if, is it a survival kit, or is it actually being able to have increased mobility uh, despite where you want to go. And I think I take the latter one. So here you will get something to put water ah, in. Yes. And that's, of course, very important to have fresh, clean water. And finally, I won't have to use these uh, non-recyclable uh, throwaway bottles. Thank you very much for this. Yes. I'll advertise the 20 <laughs> years for <a> baby. Thank <laughs> you. And, you know, we are all dedicated to have our mobile phones and what do we do when they're not charged so then you need some charging of your mobile Ooh. phone this is extremely useful. give a call to someone that can come and pick you up this is actually something that would be extremely useful to distribute uh, to migrants yeah. right yeah exactly yeah. absolutely because without mobile phones they are really in danger yeah and being a dentist in my deep heart soul <laughs> you can never go anywhere without a decent good toothbrush where it says 20th anniversary of Malmö University. So there you are. And you can put all this in our fantastic bag. And thank you once again for a fantastic talk here and adding on to our whole theme of this day. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. <laughs> thank you. <a> great gift. <laughs> <clears throat> And happy birthday to Malmö University. <laughs> <laughs>
uh, I, I have an announcement for you that going to be in the dinner at the um, City Hall. The dinner will start at 7 o'clock, so please be there on time. 7 o'clock.